Parkinson on race and patriotism. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to tonight's terrific conversationalists. But let me remind you that throughout this series, which you will be able to see on our archived events site too, we're digging deep on historiography. Historiography is the ongoing writing of history by historians. It's about how historians respond to one another's research, and it's about how we integrate new information, new methods, new perspectives. And we think historiography is just as important for public audiences as it is for specialists. That's part of why we've made OI scholarship available to read vis-a-vis uh, -vis this uh, open link, which I've just put in the chat in case you haven't visited it. Um, also, you can message me on Twitter if you'd like us to send you a historiography is lit sticker or you can email us at oieahc at wm.edu. Two more things. We will have a Q&A starting at about 645. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. We'll also keep the chat open for now, and I'm not reading it right now, so if you're sending me messages about how this is going, I'm not seeing it, I'll see it after. Um, but we will keep the chat open, but the Q&A is a lot easier for me to pull questions from, so please use that. Last thing, you're going to get a survey from us about this event, and we really appreciate you responding and filling it out. We're doing a lot of work to keep improving our programs, and your feedback really, really helps. So, advanced thanks. Okay, to our wonderful conversationalists. Michael McDonnell is professor in the Department of History at the University of Sydney, where it is breakfast time. <laughs> We're very glad to have Mike with us. Mike is the author of many books and essays, among them his first book, which was published with the OI in 2007, The Politics of War, Race, Class, and Conflict in Revolutionary Virginia, and the prize-winning Masters of Empire, Great Lakes Indians, and the Making of America from Hill and Wang in 2015. Manisha Sinha is the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut, and she's also the author of lots of great work, but I'm going to call out an article that is on our list of accessible materials to cast just obloquy on oppressors, Black Radicalism in the Age of Revolution, published in the William & Mary Quarterly, also in 2007. And in 2017, The Slaves Cause, um, an ab a History of Abolition, her book won the Frederick Douglass Book Prize from the Gilder Lehrman Institute. The Slaves' Cause was also long listed for the National Book Award. One thing you'll note here is that Mike's OI book and Manisha's WMQ article were both published in 2007. And in fact, Mike also had an award-winning article in the WMQ that year. So I don't know what to say about 2007, except it was a good year. And we're so delighted to have you two in conversation. So this is where I'm going to step off, but I'll come back in about 40 minutes with questions from the audience. So over to you guys, and thanks so much. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, and I think we thought I might start us off. Um, and I thought I'd start with what we here in Australia call an acknowledgement of country. And I've written a little bit about this. Um, and I think it's called the land acknowledgement and becoming increasingly um, familiar to you in the United States as well. But I've put up a link in the webinar chat at the very start about some reflections on it. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Gamarago people of the North Shore of what we now call Sydney Harbour and the Gadigal peoples of the South Shore, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which respectively I now live and on which the University of Sydney, where I work, was built and which were taken from them without their consent, treaty or compensation. Um, this land that I live on now has always been a meeting place, a learning space for many Aboriginal nations. And as teachers and students, we can and should and must do better to draw strength and guidance from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, knowledge, one of the oldest knowledge systems in the world and indigenous um, knowledges in general. Uh, on a related front too, um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here. Thank you very much for inviting uh, me here. Uh, it's a particular privilege when I know there's so many more knowledgeable folks out there in the audience today uh, and outside of our uh, little bubble here. Um, knowledgeable folks about topics uh, under discussion today about which I still, still see myself as very much a learner. Um, I'm really no expert, I think, on, on the particular topic. I'm now in conversation with an expert, uh, but uh, I'm still very much learning and very much eager to learn about uh, this. And, and about hearing a much greater multiplicity and diversity of voices in this conversation. But I thought I would kick us off as well 
on that front, in terms of Indigenous knowledges, one of the, I guess, one of the more formative, influential uh, readings that I use uh, and that have influenced me is by a, a Native American uh, scholar, M. Scott Momaday, uh, a member of the Kiowa or Kiowa Nation. And in his Way to Rainy Mountain, um, it's a wonderful book, a uh, short book. It's a great, I, I, just it's such a, a, a rich book um, that I use in my teaching um, from really first year students all the way up to postgrad students. And he starts the book by talking about what history is. And he talks a lot about, he, he calls, his definition is history is a turning and returning of myth, history, and memoir. And for me, that's very resonant. I, you know, I, I, I believe that the products, the, the, the stuff that we write, the history that we write is, is not just sort of determined by the books that we read. It's determined by the kind of the culture that we're enmeshed in, uh, the sort of traditions that we've grown up with, the, the sort of the inescapable kind of culture uh, that, we're, uh, that we're subject to uh, and contributing to, and the kind of movements and issues of the day. And that's sort of the, the slightly mythic part of the, the historiography. And that's mixed with the history, uh, which is, you know, the snippets of information we can glean from the archives, the bits and pieces of uh, scraps of information that, that we sort of pull together in particular ways. And, uh, and, and then that's also combined with a very kind of subjective memoir type uh, 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 approach in which we bring our, our own questions and our own lives into the kinds of questions that we're interested in and the kinds of questions that we pursue and our own lenses through which we view the kind of the culture that we're in and the snippets that we find in the archives. So with that sort of uh, kind of very open-ended um, definition of perhaps what I think of as historiography, Manisha, what do you think? I think you're, you're also an archivist or it's just, you love delving into the archives, so maybe you'd stress the archival work a bit more. Thank you, uh, Michael. That's a great question. Um, I would also like to begin, though, by, by thanking Karen and Martha and Kelly and everyone in uh, the Omohundro Institute for putting this together and Michael for being so gracious uh, to zoom in from Australia, which is just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and begin also with an acknowledgement that we have at the University of Connecticut to the Native peoples um, in, on whose land I am speaking. And I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the occupied territory of the Mohegan, uh, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skate Cope, Golden Hill Pau Gus It, and Nipmuc peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. And so I'm especially glad, Michael, that you brought up the example of doing history from a Native perspective. Uh, and, and you're right, you know, when I teach my students uh, the history of any period, uh, and today we are really interested in talking about uh, the American Revolution and the relatively forgotten story of, of Black radicalism, of Black revolutionary thought, thought from this period, uh, I think it is uh, only appropriate uh, that we actually uh, think about uh, these issues um, before we uh, begin our conversation on the topic. Uh, the text that I have always used is actually a very old one, uh, which pretty much makes the same point that you do. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, What is History? by E.H. Carr. It was given to me by my father when I announced to him that I would be doing history. Uh, in college, and uh, so it's it's a really old book, but I think it's it's kind of timeless in the ways in which it tells us how influenced we are by the times that we write in, and, and though it does not give up on the idea of writing evidence-based history, 
it's very mindful of the fact that historians are writing, uh, you know, in the time periods they're living in, they're influenced uh, by all sorts of things that are happening around them. Uh, and uh, now we know after Thomas Kuhn's book that that's actually true even for scientists, uh, you know, where they at least pretend to aspire to a higher degree of objectivity than, than we do. Uh, but I think it is important to, to remember that, uh, especially when talking about the revolution. And I was wondering, Michael, if you would tell us a little bit more about your book, uh, The Politics of War, and what influenced you to write that book, because that's not your father's American Revolution, right? It's not what you were taught in high school. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't have any of the sort of mythologies associated with the American Revolution or what was um, unfortunately called for a long time the founder's chic, you know, where uh, an obsessive amount of attention to some of the founding fathers, rightly so, but it really made the story of the American Revolution far more complex, far wider. Uh, there was a sort of a class analysis of the politics of the revolution and its results that I found fascinating when I read it. So will you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to deploy that kind of perspective, a class analysis of the American Revolution, which you know others had tried earlier, you think of the earlier progressive historians, but I think what you do in terms of simply unearthing the social history of the revolution in Virginia is actually rather unique. Um, well, thank you very much for that, Manisha. It's very generous of you. Um, it's interesting too. I, I actually pair M. Scott Momaday's uh, Way to Rainy Mountain with E.H. Carr's What is History? And, and both of them, I think, together uh, really generate a great deal of discussion amongst the students. They really they love the metaphors that E.H. Carr uses in that, um, in that article, um, as well as the approach of, of M. Scott Momaday. Uh, so I'm glad that, uh, he was, he was uh, mentioned as well. Yeah, look, it's, um, I guess in some ways, in part, um, I need to, to do a little biography, a little memoir, um, to sort of explain where that book came from uh, and maybe how it was generated in part because, um, uh, and it, you know, it always starts with ourselves, I suppose. Uh, I was born in Wales, um, uh, in, uh, and my, my parents were very working class uh, uh, folks in South Wales. Um, and uh, they moved when I was about five to Canada. And I think they only moved in some ways because my dad had, uh, against the wishes of his family, had gone to university in part because the university was free. And I think that's, we really need to make that point here in Australia at the moment uh, where fees are rising. Uh, he went to university because it was free and because he could play rugby um, uh, at university rather than get a job and have to stop playing rugby. And he went against the wishes of his family. But once he'd done that, I think he sort of opened his eyes a little bit to the world and realized there were different places to live and different ways to live. Uh, and he and my mum moved to Canada when I was about five years old. And I grew up in a very kind of, um, what I remember as an idyllic kind of multicultural immigrant, um, new immigrant uh, community, um, where as a, as a Anglo, um, I was in the minority, I think, uh, in, my, in my primary school, public school. Um, and funny enough, we, for some reason, we had some uh, teachers in my high school that were interested in American history. I was, so I was interested in American history. And when I went to university, I was interested in pursuing American history. Uh, and I remember when I went to start my honors thesis, uh, I asked, I was really interested in African American history. Um, and my professor at the time said, uh, uh, it's all been done. Uh, and this was in 1980. Uh, nine, uh, that African history, American history, as it pertained to the American Re Revolution, at least, had all been done already, uh, and there wasn't much room. So I sort of, uh, as a, I guess, a good Canadian kid, ended up focusing my honor thesis on the Black Loyalists, um, and I did a little bit of uh, microfilm reading uh, and looking at the records of a few Black Loyalists in London, in fact. Um, uh, then... Then, sorry, and I'm going on, I know. Uh, then I went to um, Britain, uh, ended up in Britain for various different reasons. 
uh, to, uh, to start at least some postgraduate work. And suddenly that kind of rosy, rose-tinted, middle-class, multicultural upbringing that I'd had in Canada, uh, I was very much confronted with two stark things. Life at Oxford, very sort of still a very elite, hierarchical, um, uh, upper class bastion, and my own extended family in South Wales that I was able to reconnect with. Uh, you know, my, my cousin who was four months younger than me didn't get an opportunity to go to university, living on a council estate, and living a, in a world in, in which was very, very different than the one I'd grown up with in Canada. And I think I sort of became very politicized in Britain. It was 1990. Uh, Thatcher, the, 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 it was just the, as Thatcher was being brought down because of uh, the poll taxes uh, that she tried to introduce there, I became very politicized, became very aware of class and class differences and, and the kinds of ways that they uh, sort of influence the, 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 the lives that we lead. And so I had started the book, started the, the postgraduate work thinking I was going to write about Virginia and how uh, elites in Virginia pulled off a very successful revolution because that's what the historiography was telling us, that, that the revolution was sort of, even in the midst of a slave society, was a kind of a very seamless process. And, um, and as I dug deeper, I realized that it all was not what it seemed, at least on the pages of those, the writings of those so-called founding fathers. Uh, particularly the, the ones that I could get my hands on in Britain at the time. And when I went to uh, Virginia to do my archival work, not only was I able to delve deeper into the court records uh, and petitions of various peoples, but I also was able to sort of get a sense of, of Virginia society. And gosh, the kinds of um, public housing developments that I saw that were largely populated by African-Americans, but not not universally so, very much resembled the kinds of council estates that I saw and, and, and uh, spent time in, in Britain. And I think I was really interested in that period in cla with class mostly, um, rather than African American history specifically. Uh, and very interested in kind of looking at the ways in which different peoples interacted during the revolution. And I think there was a growing, there was a group of uh, Anglo kind of American scholars at the time, who, at the time it sounds like ancient history now, I suppose it is, who were interested in issues of class and rethinking ideas of class in the revolutionary period. And though the book was published in 2007, the research for that was mostly done in between about 1995 and 2000. Uh, and the writing sort of, you know, around 2000. So again, I think the kinds of questions that I was asking then are very different from the kinds of questions that I was interested in by the end of the book. And, um, and by that point, I think scholars like yourself had really reinvigorated or were beginning to reinvigorate a, a kind of a sense of African-American history and the revolutionary period. And I think I finished that book looking at, uh, I think the chapter that, that um, they've excerpted on the website is the final chapter, which is called Defeat, which is ironically about uh, uh, Yorktown. Um, and in part, it was entitled, I entitled it Defeat because Virginia was in such a mess by 1781 and the kind of divisions that had been uh, bubbling up and 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 created over the, the, the period of the war uh, really had rent asunder white society but also uh, I, you know it, in many ways when we look at it from a different perspective from african-american perspectives really Yorktown was a defeat um, it was the end of a phase of an african-american revolution and movement towards uh, independence and I didn't really know what to do at the time with that aspect of it. And in some ways it was fortuitous, your 2007 article um, on black radicalism, I think was really helped me later after the book was published to kind of, to understand that, that there's a much bigger story of African American, of an African American age of revolution than just that particular moment or, 
of the American Revolution. So now I'm going to turn it back to you, Malaysia, and ask about about how you came to to the American Revolution. Um, yes, you are absolutely right. I mean, uh, when I think of the time that I was in graduate school, which was roughly the same time as you were. Um, you know, it was not as if African American history was not done. It was indeed done, and and certainly since the sixties, it was a, a flourishing and vibrant field. But I also felt that it was kind of ghettoized in American history, just as some other subfields were, like women's history. And there was no attempt to actually rethink the American past through the lens, let's say, of African American history or Native history or women's history. And, and that always bothered me. Uh, and uh, even though I ended up writing my first book on, on the politics of slavery, uh, I was really interested in seeing the manner in which uh, slavery was not just something that affected black people and that was eventually gotten rid of, <coughs> but how it impacted the entire American project. So for this session in particular, uh, when I think of the article that I wrote for, for the William & Mary Quarterly, which uh, I, I guess people have access to, uh, thanks to the Mahandro Institute, um, I was really interested in not just looking at African Americans as uh, wanting to be included within a discourse of uh, revolutionary republicanism that had already been established mainly by the founders, uh, and, and that they were literally pleading entry into it. Uh, and that eventually with the abolition of slavery, that's what happens. People just got included uh, while that, that discourse basically remained unchanged. And I, I just thought that that was a very simple way of understanding uh, black radical thought uh, at that time, uh, which clearly had an impact on revolutionary republicanism. Uh, there was a black revolution too in the age of revolutions. It was not just the American and the French. We often forget the Haitian revolution. We forget the Latin American wars of independence that came shortly thereafter in the early 19th century. And so I, I wanted to sort of rethink the revolutionary era through the lens of abolition uh, and particularly through the lens of black radicalism. Uh, and I started looking at the ways in which African-Americans uh, talked about the revolution, talked about the American experiment in Republican government. Uh, and it was important for me to, to unearth that. Uh, now, clearly, there had been, you know, Black writers and historians uh, uh, right from the 19th century uh, who had unearthed some of these sources. Uh, we knew that there were these uh, very uh, dramatic orations on the ending of the African slave trade immediately after the revolution uh, and on Northern emancipation. Uh, you know, some of these were listed in compilations of, uh, uh, you know, different uh, speeches given by African Americans in the early American Republic. But I was doing research at the Schomburg and I found many other orations which people had not mentioned. Even some new books that looked at uh, African Amer American commemorations, whether it was the African slave trade ending or uh, eventually emancipation, uh, had not actually included all of them. And, and that excited me. It's like one of those things, you know, you go to the archives and, you know, you pile through pages and pages and pages and suddenly you come across something uh, that is so, uh, that grabs your attention. Uh, and, and so these slave trade orations really did capture my attention and I noticed that a lot of them were commemorating January 1st uh, as the end of the slave trade, but they were also commemorating January 1st as the founding of the Haitian Republic. Uh, and that gave me just a whole new lens, a whole new perspective to understand how African Americans imagined and contested this project of creating uh, the new American Republic. That was not simply some ideas that were already written on stone and people asking for admission into it. But in fact, that they were contesting these ideas, challenging these ideas uh, in ways that I found actually really interesting and invigorating to read about. Um, and uh, I will just uh, mention one, you know, uh, Adam Carman's oration, which had not been discussed in any of the other sources that I had looked at, the compilations by Dorothy Porter and others, 
I was really happy to find it because not only did it have a very um, sort of strong critique of a, a Republican project based on the enslavement of people of African descent, uh, but it also had a critique of an emerging market society. And I thought this would have interested you, Michael, uh, because he's talking about lines of commerce and, and, and you know, the treatment of Africans' property, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, the other aspect which I thought was great was that African Americans were quite sensible that the Republic was founded not just on their enslavement, but also on the dispossession and enslavement and, and genocidal warfare against Native Americans. So they mention this. They always, when they have their alternative recounting of the founding, it's not, you know, Plymouth Hill, it's not James Starr. It's, it's, it begins with the fact that this is what's happened to Native Americans and this is what's happening to us. And in and, and this challenge to American exceptionalism as it is being created uh, yeah. in, 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 in the sort of more dominant discourses of American republicanism was really, you know, what was what fascinated me. And I think that's I think that's what's so powerful about the work that you've done, um, particularly in the moment that we find ourselves in now, is is that you've uncovered this kind of critique at the heart of the founding, at the moment of the founding too. It's you know that it's it's not a modern invention to say that there were critics of the revolutionary age, like I think critics, some critics at least of the sixteen nineteen project might argue that that, that you know we're opposing a kind of a presentism on the past. Um, you know, I, in the slaves' cause, you say early black activists were not so much black, black founders as the founding critics of the country. I think that's a very powerful statement. And black radicals in your black radicalism article, you say that they developed a powerful counter narrative of the revolution that put slavery and inequality and the racism that underpinned it in a kind of a transnational context as well, and at the forefront of that story that, that emphasizes freedom and independence as its central legacy. And I think you've really sort of, you've dug it kind of a, as you say, you've gotten away from that kind of marginalization or the, what's the, the I guess, what's the word for it? You know, there's the, the kind of the, the textbook that sort of talks about the story of the American Revolution and then women in the revolution, African Americans in the revolution, uh, and Native Americans in the revolution is sort of an afterthought. But you've you've actually created a narrative of the revolution that that is highly contested from the moment of its inception. And I think it's a it's, they're both wonderful pieces uh, in in that respect. Um, and you've talked, Manisha, about your surprise at finding petitions and finding orations. And I guess as I been of late turning to African American history. I'm working with a, a Claire Corbald uh, at in um, in Melbourne uh, here in Australia, and we're looking at the kind of the the in some ways it's we've taken our cue from that um, 2007 article, and we're looking at the ways that African Americans have tried to make meaning, um, or have from the American Revolution, or have looked to other revolutions like the Haitian Revolution for um, meaning making in terms of revolution. So it's very much influenced by, by your work. But again, I, I'm also surprised at, at some of the findings. Um, one, one text that I, I recently came across, I've been, maybe it's just, I'm, maybe I'm not very well read, but I, um, I've been looking at memoirs um, and I looked, I found the, the memoir of Jeffrey Brace, and I don't know, Carrie Winter did a modern edition of this, I think in 2004. Um, but here's a, 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 an African-American who found freedom in the revolutionary era. And now he didn't write the memoir, but he told his story to a sympathetic neighbor who could write the story in about 1810. And it's published. And here I am in, in you know, 2015 thinking, why have I not seen this? This is, this, is, this is a rich text of both his, you know, captivity, his uh, participation in the war, and, uh, and his life after war as a, as, as a free person who was really struggling um, and really struggled continuously in that kind of post-war period. 
And not only was it really interesting to find this, this memoir um, that, that, that is a brilliant teaching tool as well, but it was also interesting to read the way that he spun the story of the revolution because we know that lots of uh, African Americans did fight for freedom, did, you know, there were many black patriots in the American Revolution. But even Jeffrey Brace's, it's called the Blind African Slave, uh, Kerry Winter's edition of it. Even uh, Jeffrey Brace, he says he was actually forced to serve by his master. And he ended up, he got tricked into serving for five years uh, during the revolution. And when he came home, his master tried to re-enslave him. And he had to actually sue for his freedom and get some community support uh, for his freedom. And when he gets free, he says, you know, he said, I took off to Vermont um, because I had it with Connecticut. I'd had it with uh, New England. Vermont uh, had abolished slavery, I think, by that point. He knew that they had abolished slavery. But even there, he, it's not a triumphant story of a kind of a, a you know, kind of a liberating moment of independence because he details the struggles that he had with his white neighbors over land. They continually screwed him out of the land, the, the small amount of the land that he got. Then he gets married and, and people take their children uh, as, and, he, and he's frustrated because they're just, they're, you know, here he, he'd been a slave for his entire life. He'd fought during the American Revolution and there was still no equality and, um, and no sense of a, a, a real revolution uh, in his life. And again, I'm just, I'm just, I'm always amazed at the kind of the, the new texts that we can find when we look for them. Um, and, and I'd like to hear more about how you, I guess, balanced all of those wonderful archival finds with that larger narrative that you told, because I, that's the one, that's the thing I'm struggling with now is, I love getting into the details of these stories, but but there's also this like longer, larger narrative that you also have to tell them. And with the slaves cause, that's an expansive trajectory that you've covered there. Um, I just wondered about some of the struggles that you had putting that together with all of these wonderful little stories, micro stories. Yes, absolutely. And in a way, that's why it took me a decade to do it. <laughs> you know, it, it was so much material and, and actually an embarrassment of riches, uh, because there are two things that you said, Michael, that I think are so important. Uh, the notion that somehow uh, the 1619 Project is this kind of presentist attempt uh, to rewrite history. Uh, you know, you just go back to that time period and you look at what Black people and African Americans are saying, you know, no, we are going to talk about uh, the origins of this country in slavery, in the slave trade. We're not going to be talking about it in, in, in just uh, the terms of the revolution and nation building. Um, you know, that sensibility is something that was, you know, there in the uh, 18th century. Uh, and, and one can certainly prove it. And the second thing that you mentioned that I think is so important in terms of recovering uh, so much material in terms of narratives, memoirs, pamphlets, petitions. I mean, it is an archive. The notion that, you know, we are doomed to disappointment if we go into the Black archives is, is something I just don't buy because when I was researching this book over a very long time period, I just kept finding <clears throat> more and more. And what was interesting for me, of course, was that uh, when I uh, started writing the history of abolition and started concentrating on uh, black writing, uh, which I must say literary scholars had done much more than historians. I was told by historians, uh, this is not abolition. This is not, you know, this is not part of the abolition movement. Why are you even, you know, discussing Phyllis Wheatley's poems or, or the narratives of John Morant and John Jay and, uh, you know, other autobiographies? I mean, maybe Yolanda Iquiano, yes, he was involved in the movement to abolish the slave trade, but it was not apparent to them that, that this writing really informed the abolition movement. Um, and, and, you know, for instance, Venture Smith's narrative is very much like the narrative you discussed. It's uh, a narrative that is not triumphalist, uh, that kind of balances a, a lot of disappointments uh, in his life uh, with the attaining of his own freedom and that of his family. Uh, you know, he recounts, uh, you know, uh, 
many instances of being hoodwinked uh, by, uh, by white Americans. Uh, some of them are endangered servants even, you know, as some of them are, are richer. Uh, so they, they present a far more complex picture. But in terms of sort of reimagining the, the uh, revolutionary era, uh, in terms of understanding black radicalism at this point, I would argue that it is important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, that we shouldn't end up, uh, you know, just looking at the variety of, of, of things that I read. Uh, I, I, when I ended up writing this particular chapter in my book on revolutionary anti-slavery, I realized that if I was to talk about abolitionists at this period, um, I would have to talk about the ways in which they also engaged uh, the discourses of their time, the ways in which they engage revolutionary rhetoric, whether it was sarcasm, calling out hypocrisy, but also the ways in which they expanded those ideas uh, into things that probably was not imagined initially. Um, so it was important for me to do that too, to look at the, at the emergence of, of abolition, uh, both amongst African Americans and some, uh, a handful of white Americans uh, who joined also that crusade. I mean, we are thinking of the rise of the first abolition societies at this time. I mean, everyone knows about, uh, you know, the Society for the uh, Prevention of Cruelty, of, of, of uh, it's the long term, which eventually became the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. Uh, everyone knows about that in 1775, but they don't know about these earlier sort of semi-formal uh, committees of slaves, anti-slavery committees, or the Sons of Africa, modeled after the Sons of Liberty, who are using revolutionary discourse to make different kinds of freedom claims. Um, so, I mean, when once we weave that story back in, I think we get a much uh, deeper understanding of what the abolition movement looked like uh, during the revolutionary era and the central role played by African Americans in, in highlighting their plight, uh, whether it was in, you know, printed letters in newspapers, petitions, or freedom suits, uh, or pamphlets, narratives, memoirs, uh, they, they did deploy uh, every means that they could to in fact highlight the problem of slavery. Uh, and so I wanted to look at the origins of the abolition movement at this point uh, for that reason. Um, I would also like you to, I mean, I know we are running out of time. I'm getting a signal here. Maybe we talk too much, unfortunately. Uh, and, and maybe this is the time that we should be uh, handing it over to Karen for, for questions and answers. But I have I had so many other questions for you, Michael. Uh, but I'm afraid, uh, you know, we both tend to be to be a little garrulous, I guess. But go oh, ahead. it's 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 fantastic, and there's a lot of enthusiasm I'm seeing in the chat. A lot of enthusiasm, and thank you both so much. This is exactly the kind of conversation that I think is so rewarding um, for all of us to um, to sort of witness. You know, um, we have said casual conversation about serious history, and that's exactly what you guys are giving us. And it's just terrific. So lots of great questions. Um, I want to start with one. Um, there's enthusiasm in the chat too for your mention of particular um, uh, black political actors in the kind of revolutionary era, Jeffrey Brace, Lemuel Haynes, and so on. Um, but a question about what about black radical women in the revolutionary period? And a related subject is there, are there ways that we can expand um, the archive and expand maybe the tradition um, of thinking about radicalism in a particularly political way to incorporate other kinds of radical acts that may not have been as expressly political from a, you know, kind of narrow traditional um, perspective. That's Manisha, a good you... question. Uh, sorry, Michael, you want to go ahead? Uh, but I, I, I just wanted to quickly say that, uh, you know, women are so important because they kind of take the lead in suing for their freedom. And some of the earliest writings are produced by black women. And at least in my book, I pay a lot of attention to Phyllis Wheatley and her poetry as kind of the foremother of the abolition movement. Her poetry was often dismissed, beginning with Jefferson, as, as, as trivial, as imitative, as, as not having any political content. But in fact, it has tremendous 
political content. Uh, I think some recent literary scholars have also argued that. But besides her, some other also relatively uh, unknown uh, black women, for instance, Lucy Terry Prince, uh, who adopts the colonist uh, uh, you know, dichotomies of civilization and savagery, but kind of, I think, subtly overturns it in talking about the massacre in Deerfield. So, I mean, there, there are women there, and uh, it's not as if they're absent uh, from this uh, literature. And I also looked at, uh, of course, the narrative of Mary Prince, which was published in England, and that's why the transatlantic perspective was important. But Michael, you wanted to also address this. Well, only to say that, I, I, you know, I've, I've been, again, your, your book is so encyclopedic, so encyclopedic um, that just about any topic, any person, you can delve in and you can find them in the index and you'll find some great stories about Maria Stewart. I love Maria Stewart's outspokenness uh, in the 1830s. And Marianne Shad Carey, I think I've got the right name, uh, who, you know, moves to Canada and sort of ends up having a, had, had enough and publishing a newspaper. Uh, in in the what would, would become Canada, and one of the stories I'm really fascinated in, and it ties in very nicely, uh, Karen, with that question, um, is trying to think of different ways that African Americans, um, you know, th that aren't tied to the sort of that pol more political narrative, but are very political. And one of the stories that I've uncovered and been looking at in in a bit more detail is is the story of Clorinda who um, I think Betty Wood and, and um, Sylvia Frey wrote about her a little bit in Come Shouting to Zion. And, um, and there are two narratives, one written in 1812 about her by a fellow named Henry Holcomb, and one in um, a Quaker tract in 1836. And they write about this woman who is in Beaufort or near Beaufort, South Carolina in the 1790s. And at that point, she's already in her 60s. And she's this kind of, they depict her as initially as a lame and crippled um, woman who um, people scorned, who, but who found God, who found a God. But what's really interesting when I looked at the two narratives was just the way that both the narratives sort of adopted Kalura into story, but also distanced themselves from it because she didn't fit in. And they talk about her conversion to baptism, but then talk about her perversion towards the church. And then the narr later narrative says, talks about the fact that she, um, she ended up gaining, she was, she ended up gaining her freedom. She was manumitted. And then she was given by charitable sources, um, uh, a, a kind of a means to, to have her own place. And then the 1836 track talks about her having her own people, Clorinda's people, uh, who followed her and who uh, only kind of looked to her. But what is also interesting is once she got her uh, manumission and once she got that kind of independent setup, suddenly she miraculously was healed from her lameness. And um, she lives for another sort of 20, 30 years with her own church in Beaufort, South Carolina. And it's, it's clear that she lived a very independent life from the one that she'd led up to the revolutionary period. And I'm trying to play with this and think about the kind of the meaning of that kind of religious space for Clorinda and her people and what that sort of, how we, how we work that into the story of the age of revolution. I think that's, um, that's such an important point. I'm thinking about how profoundly just um, reading Evelyn Higginbotham's Righteous Discontent um, about the Black Baptist Church and the church as this space for radicalism in the late 19th century. And of course, we know that from both of your work um, and from a lot of other work too, how important the church is as a space of organization and a space um, well, a space for space, as it were. <laughs> um, but this actually raises a, another question about the kind of long lineage of um, writers who have taken up the issue of black radicalism. And another question was about whether you all can talk about um, scholars such as Benjamin Quarles, personal favorite of mine, because he published a lot with the OI, thankfully. We're very grateful for that. Sylvia Fry, again, um, Gerald Horn, um, Lorenzo Green, just, you know, there's a, there's a long tradition of people writing about black radicalism. Um, and can you talk about that a little bit? What's important about that longer tradition? Yeah, and that's a great question because I don't think I could have ever attempted 
the book that I wrote without these early black writers and historians, right? And I, you know, I actually wrote a historical piece uh, on this, on coming of age of black abolitionism and how the periphery was going to redefine the center uh, a while ago, uh, my God, it must have been maybe 10, 20 years ago, just when I was embarking on this project. Uh, and without, you know, those community studies that Lorenzo Green did of New England or Benjamin Qualls did of Black abolitionism, and he kind of apologized and said, you know, this might sound like, you know, as if I'm just uh, talking about, uh, you know, just events and people one by one, but actually I have to prove that we were there literally. Uh, and going back to Black abolitionists themselves, who are doing this, you know, who are always talking about their presence uh, in, the, in the movement. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think without those uh, early writers and many, many more uh, who wrote in the Journal of Negro History that became the Journal of African American History today, uh, they're amazing articles. I mean, even in terms of understanding white abolitionists from uh, that era, uh, the Journal of Negro History had actually republished all their minutes and proceedings. And that made life so simple for me, because as I was writing this 10 year period, you know, more than half the things that I looked at had not yet been digitized. Uh, and just having access to all that, uh, how African American writers and scholars and historians had always been writing this alternative history and preserving the primary sources and reprinting them literally, all the proceedings of the conventions, etc. It was important for me. Uh, and I don't think my work would have been possible actually uh, without their doing this. But to quickly go back to the point that Michael made, I think that's really important when we look at this era, that it's not just this discourse of republicanism, but the role that Christianity plays. And, and you know, it provides a room, not just the first great awakening, but also the second, for women, and especially women of color, to, uh, to come out in the public and speak and, and bear witness and do different things. With their lives. So I'm thinking of John Sensbach's work on Rebecca the Moravians, uh, but I'm also thinking of, of early Black women preachers like Joanna Lee, etc. So I, I think, uh, Michael, I, I agree with you that, that Christianity uh, and Afro-American Christianity and understanding even, uh, you know, dissenting Protestant sects, Quakerism, all that is so important in recovering this history of revolutionary radicalism. Yeah, and I think in some ways it what I'm finding interesting, and I, I don't know a great deal about this, and I, I need to read up a lot more, um, but it's it's almost this critique of white Christianity as well that you see in these black writers. Um, Clorinda is, is one, she seems to sort of take Christianity, make it her own, and effectively kind of critique what she had come from it, and, and, and the church that the Baptist church had come from. But also Jeffrey Brace, um, and Boston King as well. He's another um, writer, um, uh, memoirist, um, all of whom are, are really sort of saying, I, Jeffrey Brace says it, I think, very clearly. He says, um, our non-Christian African descendants are far more Christian than you Christian, white Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, and he says, we don't need your Christianity to be Christians, <laughs> um, which is a really sort of interesting point. But again, going back to the historiography, I've been also looking at William C. Nell's uh, uh, amazing work in the 1850s, uh, trying to, and, 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 and kind of astounded at the fact that he's one of the first to really, um, really go into detail about uh, black patriot contributions, particularly in the Revolutionary War, and really detail, because of course, I, I, and again, uh, this maybe sent me down too much of a rabbit hole, you know, there's such a variety of experiences, African-American experiences in the American Revolution. But I think even today, popular culture would suggest that the ones that we focus on are the black patriots. And I think there's historical reasons for that, of course, because people like William C. Nell, writing in the 1850s, trying to kind of prove that African-Americans were, were, were participants and, and helped contribute to the American Revolution, emphasized those, those black patriots probably far more than the kind of the, the, the loyal, what we call black loyalists, iffy term, um, but those that had fought against the American Revolution and, and it sided with the British or simply were disaffected and, and, and did the best that they could for themselves. Uh, and there was a, I, I don't know about you, Manisha, but I feel like there was a great silence 
and, and kind of a, a lack of clarity about what to do in some ways with the stories of people who didn't join the Patriot cause um, in the, in, especially before William C. Nell came along. Uh, but people like then Benjamin Quarles broke open the lid, I think, on a, a kind of a much greater variety of experiences of African Americans. And I think those, those black writers have really shaped the historiography in different ways. And, uh, and, and as Manisha says, we, there's no way we would be able to write anything we, we, we have done without those. Let me bring in another question because there's, I think, literally every question we could fill hours with because this is such a um, rich and important um, set of subjects. So this is a yes or no question actually for you guys. And if the answer is no, we're just going to move right on. But a really interesting question um, about a, a wonderful exhibit um, at the Peabody Essex Museum right now of the work of um, artist Jacob Lawrence, who has imagined, it's called The American Struggle, a series of paintings imagining the American Revolution and the War of 1812 um, from Black and Indigenous perspectives. And if you have seen it, do you have thoughts about how to use that and work with that in your teaching or in your, your own speaking? And if you haven't seen it, just say no. And I've already got a, I've got a link and I'm going to paste this into the chat right now. Um, 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 <laughs> unfortunately, uh, I haven't seen it um, as yet. I, I have been literally uh, stuck at my home since March. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's right here in Massachusetts. So, I, I want to thank the person who brought it up because this this definitely behooves a trip to the Peabody to to look at it. Yeah. They've got a they've, they've got, got a, a wonderful 360 um, virtual um, tour of it. So I put it in the chat right now, and it looks really cool. And that was from a, a fellow um, denizen of Massachusetts who asked that question. Let me just say I happen to know. <laughs> okay, um, it really does sound um, pretty interesting. Okay, so here's a big question. Um, to what extent can we say that the American Revolution wasn't much of a revolution at all? This is a big question, right? This is a, one of the biggest questions about the revolution. Um, and uh, the, the writer of this question says, you know, don't revolutions turn power over to the oppressed? And clearly that didn't happen. So is it a revolution or isn't it? Ah, that's a that's an oldie, uh, old and oldie, yeah, because there were a number of progressive historians who actually argued that that you know the American Revolution was not much of a revolution because it was not about uh, you know we got home rule but not who ruled at home and there were all these uh, debates about that that it was really a war of independence it was not really a revolution in the sense of let's say the French Revolution or the um, Russian Revolution, uh, but you know, uh, I'm one of those who who would not go that far. I think the American Revolution actually was a revolution uh, because it had an ideology, a revolutionary ideology that fit uh, that age of revolution. We just have to be more capacious in our understanding uh, of what is included in those terms. Um, I know that there have been many. Uh, uh, Latin Americanists, for instance, who said that these are these are like settler colonial rebellions. They never really handed over power uh, to the truly dispossessed. Uh, and to a certain extent, of course, they're right. Um, you know, the entire national projects in the Americas of the United States too were not. So in my uh, book, I, I always highlight the fact that the one revolution that was truly abolitionist was the Haitian Revolution. Um, but we need to acknowledge that the first emancipation in the new world actually took place in the United States and it took place in uh, the northern states. Uh, and many times in states like Massachusetts, it was because of the initiative of the enslaved themselves. So when I talk about the long northern emancipation, which preceded the Haitian Revolution and which preceded British abolition, uh, we have to be able to gauge the American Revolution in different ways. Now, what did freedom mean? Did freedom mean equality and complete citizenship? It did not. Uh, what do these terms even mean to Native Americans who were not part of this, of this nation building, new nation building project, and in fact, whose uh, um, you know, increasing dispossession was predicated on that, right? So um, we can certainly interrogate uh, the limitations of uh, the revolutionary impulse. But I think to completely say that this was not a revolution, uh, that this was just a settler colonial rebellion, 
uh, that it changed nothing. Uh, I'm not. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I am uh, a big reader, not just of black historiography, but also the British Marxist school, beginning with people like Christopher Hill and E.P. Thompson and Eric Hobsbawm, uh, who remind us that there were certain ideas uh, uh, that were born at, at you know during the English Civil War in the 17th century uh, that have kind of lived on. Uh, in uh, in projects for abolition or uh, later on in, in, in socialist ideas uh, that we should really be mindful of. Um, so yeah, I would I would not go that far. But it's funny because you well you you actually anticipated another question actually about some of that English Marxist historiography. But I'm going to give Mike a slightly different question, and I'm going to give him um, a minute and a half to address it and then come back to you, Manisha, for 30 seconds of a last answer to this same question. So this is a, this is a question um, that references, Mike, you talking about in the, in the opening about how uh, faculty members discouraged you from studying early black history saying it's all been done. And the question is, do you think that anyone telling you that really thought that was the case or was this a kind of coded discouragement of doing, of working on black history in this period. That's one. But the related question is, what are students being told now? Yeah. It's all been done. So you've got a minute and a half there, and then we're going to get Manisha for 30 seconds to answer the same thing about what do we worry that students are being told now that it's all been done. I, I do think when I was told that, um, I do think that, I, I think there was a genuineness to that. I think that, uh, you know, ladies, this was, this was an older professor who, you know, had, had studied in the 1960s and 70s. And there had been a couple of books about the revolution in the 1970s and um, I think Sylvia Fry's 1991. Um, but I, I, think, I think he genuinely thought, okay, well, there's not that much evidence. You know, there's not, that, there are not many sources that you can use. And there have been a couple of books on it already, so that's that's done. I, I try not. I try to not tell my students never not to do anything. Um, and oftentimes, students will come with with topics that are that are very familiar. But I really do think that if you delve into anything in more detail, you'll find something new. Um, I, I think there are just so many stories and so many ways that we can frame these things. And understand and, and and advance the knowledge that I think I, I try not I, you know I, I, I never I am very cognizant of what I was told and I try never to do that to my students. <laughs> so you think very quick answer, yes a very quick answer Karen. yes I mean we were told in graduate school don't pigeonhole yourself into this or that and this was particularly told if you're doing African-American history or or women's history um, some of the newer sort of subfields of U.S. history, but I would argue that today we are at the cutting edge, uh, and it's not because we are doing that history, but, but we are taking that history to redefine the past in ways that was really not imaginable a few years ago. So uh, I, when I tell my students, really, my basic thing is that look, I'm a historian of slavery, abolition, civil war, and reconstruction, the long 19th century, stretching back to the revolution, and now with the new book on reconstruction going a little bit into the 20th century, but you do what you feel passionate about and what you feel ha you have a stake in. For me, you know, as someone who grew up in, in post-colonial India and came to the United States, the most fascinating questions were about race, citizenship, and democracy, and slavery, and the long afterlives of slavery. That, that interested me, and, and I studied with people who were interested in those uh, questions. So, you know, do what you feel really passionately about, and that's when I think you really care what you what you are writing about. You know, because there's a tendency sometimes um, to to write about something that is very topical or or that is very you know considered the leading uh, topic at one particular moment. And those books age very fast because they are, they, there's a constructed nature to them. Uh, but if you're really passionate about something and, you know, you will find the stuff. You just have to keep looking. I mean, I'm an archive nerd, so maybe you should just tell that to everyone. Like Michael, I'm happiest in the archives, uh, but you will find your calling right there. 
Oh, I, I agree with both of you. I just want to acknowledge that there have been so many wonderful questions um, posed. And of course, we could only get to a few of them. Wonderful questions about things like, you know, what about radicalism and, mar and marinage? What about um, other kinds of um, black radicalism into the Indian wars? What about other kind of geographical locations? What about the long history of black radicalism? How do we think about the revolutionary period? You can't address those, but I just want to acknowledge that they're really wonderful and thank you all so much. And in, in particular, thanks to you, Mike and Manisha. If we were in, if we were all together rather than all of us sitting here in my dining room, actually, we would be giving you a round of applause. So I'm just clapping anyway. Thank you so, so much for this. And thank all of you for participating. And please, um, please respond to the survey. It really helps us a lot as we put together these programs and really just thank all of you so, so much. We're grateful. So thanks so much thank, and good night. Thank you all very much for listening in and thanks, Manisha. Uh, I always learned so much from you. Well, thank you and likewise. And thanks for having us. And uh, I wish I could address all those questions. There was such a fantastic one. <laughs> I'd like to listen to you do it too. <laughs> But they were great questions, and if we ever meet in person, I will answer them. <laughs> Thank Excellent. You. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Thank you.